Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our Friday session, our last full week of classes. Just as a quick note here, um, we do have an official class on Monday, and we'll use it. Um, like I said in the weekend update email, we'll we'll try to do something with Nietzsche. Um, there's a there's a lot we could do. Normally, I like to spend a whole week on Nietzsche because uh, there's enough there to unpack um, that's worth worth engaging with. Um, we'll make the best of it. Um, I'm actually trying to decide, and I I, yeah, I was thinking about actually. Hopefully there's going to be a bunch of people here, and I could I could take a vote um, about what people might be interested in for how we go about doing this. Um, so we we have class on Monday, and then I'm also going to be using as an extra credit session um, our uh, finals period, our officially assigned finals period. I'll I'll be doing a, a special broadcast just like we've been doing normally, but it's extra credit. Um, and so I might. Uh, yeah, I have a special reading for that one. Well, man, yeah, maybe I'll 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 get your input here too. I, I might be making a decision um, that I make as best I can, but uh, yeah, it might might not hurt to get your feedback too. No no problem with that. A little democracy, um, or at least a consensus, like building this, making a decision about how to use our time uh, that's remaining. Um, but doing doing a little bit with Nietzsche is something I'd like to do. Hopefully we'll get to doing a little bit of Nietzsche today. That's part of my plan. Um, I had a little bit uh, following up with Williams still. There's like the, the last bit of Williams I definitely want to touch on at least a little bit without um, missing out on, on sort of the culmination of that discussion. But I also wanted to see if there's any... Uh, I wanted to start class today just by seeing if there are any... Um, sort of questions that have come up about the papers uh, you know we're getting close to the end here um, you you've got feedback from me and from a peer um, in most cases uh, still missing a, a couple of those response papers but um, you get you're getting some feedback from me and a peer to work on developing your paper into its final draft form and I'm just curious to see if everyone understands what's going on with that um, and if there are any other questions that I can I can sort out on that front. I wanted to give a little space for that. So everyone in chat, uh, how, how are you feeling about uh, the final draft, the expectations for it, any any general questions about it? No? Okay. So far so good? Okay. I'm, I'm here and all through next week I'll be available too. Um, if you want to talk over anything or get a second opinion or some other feedback, um, any like I said before with my uh, feedback videos, if there's anything that is unclear about what I'm giving you in terms of the feedback, I would want to clarify that. And if there's any questions about, say, say you're like, I understand the feedback, I just don't know what to do about it, then I'm happy to give you some more assistance on that as well. Okay. Um, if anything comes up, just drop it in the chat, and I'll um, if you think of something. Um, but let's let's get moving here, so we can get the most out of our time together. Um, all right. So we were talking about this kind of line from the amoralist person, or the person who might seem to be the amoralist, who might actually just be the immoralist, about their sort of rejection of a moral lifestyle. And we were we were following this thread about how. Um, they might the person who doesn't participate in morality might be rather pleased with themselves for doing so or they uh, what was the there was a phrase that Williams used if they think of themselves as rather splendid I like that turn of phrase they think of themselves as rather splendid for not playing the game of morality then they really are playing the game of morality that was one point but also Williams just kind of wanted to target the logic of maybe that immoralism that um, to kind of uh, have a um, a conception of virtue of like an ideal person that isn't responsive to considerations of justice or compassion or something like that. This is really a kind of Nietzschean type of person, and so that's why this is kind of a, a nice lead into Nietzsche. As I was saying in the lecture yesterday, Nietzsche sort of um, I'm kind of roping a little Nietzsche in here too, killing two birds with one stone. Nietzsche is sharply critical of what he calls uh, either conventional morality or sometimes just morality flat or um, what he sometimes calls slave morality, 
we'll talk about that maybe a little bit. Um, he's really critical of it, and, and rhetorically it sounds like he's against morality. But um, I think under careful analysis, he still is offering a moral outlook or a moral vision. It's just non-standard. Um, and the, the standard model of like um, morality is about human rights or about j considerations of justice, that we owe things to each other, or that um, we ought to be concerned with people's well-being to have compassion for them. Um, Nietzsche is critical of that. And Williams is sort of like, yeah, on what grounds does this make sense? Um, like the appeal to say that the person who acts in this morally deviant way or doesn't respect con conventional morality um, or, or these traditional conceptions of morality like justice and compassion is somehow more courageous or more authentic or more free. Um, Williams is like, I'm not buying that shtick. And so the, get, just to catch us back up to speed with what I was talking about at the end of class yesterday, first line is that um, that uh, people who act morally don't just do so out of fear. This might be plausible. Actually, Plato talks about this at the very beginning of The Republic, in Book 2 of The Republic, which I actually teach in my ethics class. It's a very similar discussion that happens. Um, there's this kind of cynical, fatalistic opponent who's like, justice is bullshit. This is Trasimachus. His, that's his name. He's like, justice is bullshit, uh, it's just a lie, uh, it's an illusion, and that what really matters is power. Power is what matters, and the only reason that people uh, play the moral game is because they're too weak or scared to really pursue power and, and like maximize their, their influence. And so they, they act morally against their will. And Williams is like, yeah, that doesn't seem plausible. Because the people who are the moralists, who, who are like, yeah, I actually do make decisions based on considerations of, of uh, compassion and justice, um, they want it. It's not just something that they are afraid of the cops, right? But that they, they are actually authentically invested in caring for other people and treating that as an object of value and meaning. But the reply from to that point from this kind of cynical Trasimachus side or Nietzschean side would be like, eh, that's just social conditioning, right? That's when Nietzsche talks about slave morality or the morality of the masses, um, that they're kind of weak people. And, and, and they're just conditioned into uh, adopting these values and standards for living. And... Um, so maybe the, maybe they do authentically want it to themselves, but that want is a derivative of their social conditioning. And then this is where I wanted to pick it up, because this is kind of an interesting argument from Williams. Um, the, the other kind of line about this is, um, well, oh, let, let me do this part, this step first. Williams first says, um, well, there isn't anything special about just saying it's a part of social conditioning. He's, he just embraces it. He's like, duh, of course there's going to be social conditioning here. Um, but is this any more problematic than any of the other things that are socially conditioned? Like being able to use language is socially conditioned, but we don't think it's illegitimate because of that. Um, to, uh, to be able to uh, reason or like do mathematics is a, a matter of social conditioning. Um, but that's not necessarily a defeater for the legitimacy of that either. Um, so social conditioning is sort of like a ubiquitous element of human life, and to identify it as being present with something doesn't doesn't defeat it. That's the first line. Um, but then the the cynical kind of view comes back and says, well, but are those um, moral motivations just covering up for a deeper or more primitive character of human nature, kind of like lifeboat situations he talks about, uh, Williams brings up. Like when someone says, this is, and this is like the Joker stuff, right? Like um, in, in, is it Dark Knight Rises, where the Heath Ledger one that has Two-Face in it too? Uh, or, um, gosh, I can't remember the titles of all those movies. Dark Knight? Yeah, okay, okay, Dark Knight. So in that, like, think about um, the kinds of scenarios that the Joker's cooking up, right? This kind of social engineering that he does. His sort of view is that um, morality is just skin deep. It's superficial. 
And the deeper reality is that people are assholes, <laughs> right? That they're, they're fundamentally amoral. And we play this game of morality that just sort of covers that up. And he's creating situations that sort of reveal the people's true character. That, that's kind of part of the, the moral drama with his character, um, is sort of revealing this. Um, this underlying arbitrariness that is present that the story of morality is saying things are principled, but they're really not. Um, so like in a lifeboat situation, then you see how people really act. Like we're only moral to the extent that it's convenient and in our self-interest to do so. This is another argument that comes straight out of um, book two of the Republic from Plato. Um, but William says, uh, he sort of is like, uh, even even if we would predict that there, there is the moral values um, don't end up influencing people's actions in these extreme circumstances where they're backed up against the wall, what should we really say about that? Like, what is the judge of what is true, what's the metric for what is true human nature? And I really like this quote from Williams. I think it, it's, it's thought-provoking on this. He says, if there's such a thing as what people are really like, it may be it's not so different from what they are actually like. That is, creatures in, whom li in whose lives moral considerations play an important, formative, but often insecure role. So the fact that under some situations we are weak in our ability, in our virtue or character, and we don't actually do what morality demands, we abandon our moral principles under some circumstances, that doesn't mean that they have zero impact on, on who we are, or that in those other cases in which we do act in accordance with them, that those are some, somehow rendered illegitimate or inauthentic. Um, the other, the other kind of point I like about this, he says, why, why should anything be a test of what the true nature is like if we're studying um animals like like non-human animals and trying to understand what their nature is we don't observe them under like super extreme circumstances that are the abnormal cases that they behave in we look at the nominal cases that they behave in um we don't put them into highly strenuous circumstances and then whatever they behave there, we're like, that's what the animal's true nature is or something. So maybe we shouldn't do that with humans either. Um, there's a, a, another sort of philosopher that gets into this, a political philosopher is Hobbes. Ha, I mean, how many of you have uh, read any of Hobbes' Leviathan, something like that, familiar with Hobbes' state of nature idea? Not yet? This might be a tangent I shouldn't go on, but Hobbes is, is asking questions about um, what should a government look like? How should society be structured? Basically, principles of social justice. The political philosophy is all about that. And Hobbes is, is imagining this kind of what happens in a state of nature. What reason would people have to submit themselves to a government? And it's very, very similar to the discussion that happens in Book 2 of Plato's Republic, where there's a question of why would anyone submit to moral principles of justice? And the idea, one of the ideas with cynical view, is that people just do it out of self-interest. It's like, if I don't screw with you, then you don't screw with me. I will, I will adopt this kind of standard for how we are going to coordinate our interactions because, not because I actually care about you, but because I receive some benefit. So I give up some opportunity to gain advantage from you, kind of unjustly, in order to gain protection from you doing the same thing to me. It's like an insurance policy. Morality is like a, a self-interested insurance policy. Um, that's one way to look at it. Um, but Hobbes has a, a bunch of classic competitors here. Um, or opponents like, say, John Locke, who takes real big issue with the way Hobbes is setting up um, what people are essentially like prior to civil society. He's like, I don't think that, uh, you know, Hobbes in his state of nature says it's the state of war of all against all. Like a state of anarchy is where everyone is against everyone else. And it's all this big, massive, self-interested battle. And Locke is like, no, that's not what happens in a state of nature. Without a, a social system like a government or cultural institutions or things like that, there, it isn't as though everyone is 
only thinking about their self-interest. Locke argues that it's a basic part of human nature to also be concerned about each other, that we're pro-social, and that we find meaning and value in being positively oriented with others and caring about them, and not just like, what can I get out of you? Um, and, and Locke does admit that, again, that kind of like in William's position, they're very, very similar here, that it's an insecure part of us. It doesn't always manifest. You still have people with bad actions or, or that are bad actors who are going to sacrifice, they're going to choose in favor of self-interest over those opportunities for valuing or being invested in the good of others. Um, and that's why we may want to have a civil society so that we can have a, a better way of being consistent with uh, fulfilling moral requirements um, and making sure that we're doing so in a fair, unbiased way. That's part of the, the point of having a government as far as Locke is concerned. Um, but it's not as though the the base level here is pure selfishness and that somehow the person who is against conventional morality like compassion and justice is being a more authentic person. That's what, what Williams is really challenging. So I think that's that was kind of interesting, an interesting discussion and worth mentioning. Um, we're going to kind of stop the thread there. There's probably more room for that discussion to go further. Um, but it, I just want to put it across your radar as like a fun thing for reflection, a very important topic for reflection. And if you're interested, I highly recommend reading The Republic. Um, it's, a, it's a good book. Okay. So the final thing about Williams here is what his contribution is to this discussion of why be moral. And Williams has a very interesting tack um, about how to think about this. And he starts his approach by first asking the question, um, when we're talking about the amoralist, do they care about anybody? Do they have preferences that involve other people as the objects? That doesn't necessarily mean morality. Because we were talking before about how the amoralist can have preferences for things. Um, Williams talks about a kind of um, protagonist of some gangster movie and like um, I was thinking of I don't know movies like the Tra the transporter or um, or uh, actually one of the best ones is shoot 'em up have you ever seen that Clive Owen film it was kind of an indie film uh, anyone ever see shoot 'em up no okay maybe this is where the, it's um it's a weird indie film. It's basically like a 90-minute gun battle action sequence. I mean, it's just tons and tons of violence. It's got Clive Owen in it, um, and it's it's a pretty superficial movie. It's in many ways like pretty amoral. I mean, the main premise is um, Clive Owen is like friends with a prostitute or something, and she has a child, and these other gangsters are trying to kill the child. It's a baby. So the whole movie, he's just, like, running around with this baby in his arms and just, like, shooting all of these people. And he's got a carrot. He's always eating a carrot for, I don't know, whatever reason. It's weird. It's a weird movie. Um, it does, it's kind of silly. Um, but in that scenario, like, I don't look at Clive Owen's character as a, a paragon of morality, and they don't really set him up this way. But he is, like caring for this baby you know he's protecting this baby's life and it's not like he's i'm a believer in fundamental human rights or something he just cares about it and he's willing to kill all these people to protect its life and that may not be the right decision you know there might be some more ethical ways of dealing with this problem than going on a killing spree you know um character complexity yeah david um but uh there's this might fit the bill of what Williams is talking about, about how someone could be an amoralist and still care about people. But what if the answer is no, that they don't care about anybody, then Williams says, well, then they're a psychopath. And he says it would be idiotic to reason with them. And this is controversial. Um, I'll just tell you, I don't, I, because of my meta-ethical commitments about what I think morality is, and what, it, what sort of cognitive or psychological requirements are conditions for being able to participate in the moral realm. Um, I actually don't think psychopaths are cut off from this or that reasoning with them is idiotic. Um, this is sort of uh, a consequence of some of the assumptions that, or the, the philosophical theories that Williams is operating with, as we'll see in a minute here. Um, but here, let me give, so this is, this is all contentious, and, and I personally disagree with Williams on this, but let's try to understand the logic that he's coming from. 
this is kind of like when he opened up the whole discussion of just trying to define what the amoralist is, and he bracketed away um, someone who is just in despair about everything. And he's like, that's not going to pose a threat to the rationality of morality, because this isn't a, a case where even reasoning is like available to, to kind of work with. Um, this might be a person that we could be, but it's not one that we would like, if we had a choice about it, that we'd be like, yes, I, I think I'm going to go for this situation where I'm unable to engage with the reasons for meaning making or being invested in anything or something like that. Like Robert Williams was saying, this isn't a flaw of rationality. This is like a, a failure of humanity. Um, that ha It's like maybe the weakness of our... Are, or the contingencies or vulnerabilities of our psychological realities that we could end up in a space of despair like this. Um, I'm not so sure I agree with him about that either, <laughs> because I think there's there's definitely a rational structure to despair as well, and we can take seriously the idea of there being reasons for despair. There could be justifications for it as being appropriate, um, but Williams doesn't look at it that way. Um, same kind of thing is happening here for understanding his logic. He sees the psychopath as someone we can't choose to be. So it's not really a viable option. If you're not a psychopath and you do care for people, then he's like, okay, we can work with that. But it, it's not as though we, it, if we're asking for a reason, why should I care about morality? It's like, well, we have to look at what the actual options are. And Williams is thinking being a psychopath is not a realistic option. So I, we don't need to in, in kind of engage with it um, rationally. We don't need to give a reason for not doing that if it's not even an option anyway. I think that's kind of the, the reasoning, the logic that he's using here. Um, it's, he, he does commit. It's not, a, it's not a realistic alternative form of life that we could choose. Some people might still be in it, and that's what it concerns me. <laughs> I'm like, eh, I don't know. And you can even, I, I think it's plausible, or I should turn my hat for this because I'm talking about my, my pos position or perspective on this, but I think it's plausible to imagine that there, let's say, a kind of science fiction scenario. I recognize that because of my psychology, how I was just born, that I um, do have sympathetic feelings for other people. Like, I have preferences that involve other people's well-being as the object. But if I'm really entertaining this question, why should I be moral? If I have an option, maybe through the use of technology, to get rid of that part of myself, should I do that? I, even if we don't imagine, I guess, a really big science fiction, like Black Mirror kind of episode about this kind of thing where I could use technology to modify my psychology in this way, certainly I could like train myself into doing this. So I, I've got a lot of experience with Buddhism and meditation and the way in which you can kind of work on your character and change it. And there, there are some versions of um, pseudo-Buddhist spiritualism that I've seen that really do seem amoral. That are about training your um, training kind of uh, compassionate attachment out of your system. Like in the name of being detached, you're actually just training apathy. Like, not, and I don't think that's that's Orthodox Buddhism by any stretch of the imagination. Like a Buddhist is not going to go down for that. But this is kind of like a twisted up version of something that Buddhism is about, because they recognize attachment is a very natural human psychology sort of thing and it's problematic for creating suffering and they say you can do something about that you can kind of deconstruct desire so that you're no longer attached buddhism would just say the way to do that is always with compassion at the forefront and so compassion is the central value for for the buddhist um, but imagine someone who's like yeah i'll do all of that without the compassion part and and it's a it, we have some pretty amazing powers if we really put our effort into it, of changing our character in some pretty drastic ways. And so even if right now I've got feelings, it seems possible for me to entertain a choice in which I put myself on a path where I'm like, I'm just going to stop caring about others. I'm going to make myself dead to their considerations so that I'm not burdened by them anymore and they don't affect me. That seems to me like a realistic alternative. Not saying that we should be doing it, but just that we could do it. And so maybe we do need to take it seriously from a, a rational standpoint of entertaining this question, why be moral? Like, why should I not do that? Or why would I maybe think that I should do that? Um, 
you know, should I make myself into the kind of person that can be morally responsive, or should I be making myself into the kind of person that won't be morally responsive? Um, I think in, even if we don't ever give up on this entirely, there's a lot of aspects of modern life which encourage us to become more morally apathetic out of some self-interested reason. Um, so that, that's another thing that we could probably go on for quite a long time. But and, and what I'm throwing down here, making sense chat, how are we doing? I, I'm seeing a lot of action in the in the uh, uh, IM conversation so far. How are we doing? I just want to check in. Am I making sense? You following along? Thumbs up. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so let's just kind of set aside some of those objections to Williams. We can, we could like grant, grant he, his, some of these premises for him for the sake of argument. What does he want to do with this? Okay, well, if the answer to the question is yes, that the amoralist does care about somebody, then he's saying, okay, well, that means the amoralist isn't wholly selfish. Okay, so um, you can imagine valuing others as an extension of your own ego. Like maybe, maybe a parent does this with their child. They're concerned about their child, but really just because they identify that child with their own ego, and so it's really a self-interested sort of thing. But um, William says... That doesn't have to be the story about everything here. That in many of these cases, the amoralist, they're not, they're not thinking about universal principles of morality or anything like that, about what's appropriate or inappropriate. But when they have this preference for the well-being of someone else, like, say, the, um, the Clive Owen and the baby or something, they just are like, I'm, I want this to happen for this person. That's it. As Williams puts it, they don't think, um, I... Um, He's talking about like if someone's in in need of help, they don't think um, they need help and I like them, so I will help them. They're just like they need help. I'm going to do that. So it doesn't always have to have a reference to the self-interested part. Um, if you if you're sympathetic with the view or you find yourself intuitively drawn toward the view that all actions are selfish, this is called the thesis of psychological egoism. Uh, let me know if you want to pursue that topic more because there's, uh, there's some stuff I can give you. It's a very interesting topic. But I can just kind of report right now that um, as far as contemporary philosophy is concerned, psychological egoism is kind of a dead theory. The idea that all of our actions are really done ultimately from self-interest, that our own selves are always the object of our value for everything else, um, it doesn't seem to be capable of being consistently maintained as just a psychological thesis, not as an even an, an aspect of ethical evaluation, but it's just that this is implausible. You can kind of, if you've thought about this before, um, this idea like everyone is deep down selfish about everything, that even altruistic action is really in fact selfish. Um, you can, maybe you've noticed how you, you can kind of tell a selfish story about any person's action, even things that seem on the face of it incredibly altruistic. You can, you can tell some kind of cynical story about how it actually is deeply self-interested. Um, but that fact that you can tell a story doesn't mean that that is the accurate explanation for what is happening in that scenario. And that, that's one of the main arguments that contemporary philosophers have been kind of compelled by for why psychological egoism is, is sort of strains credulity as a actual explanation of why people do what they do. But the other argument that's really kind of made waves that I think is an interesting one to present here is that it's actually impossible. So it kind of turns the argument on the egoist's head here that if normally the egoist is saying, well, the only reason why you would care about anybody else is because of some extension of yourself, right, as, as something that ends up citing yourself, that altruistic action is impossible. This objection says, actually, it's the exact opposite. It's self, purely selfish action or purely self-interested action is the thing that's impossible. Why? Well, because of this logic. If I care about myself, if I treat myself as the only thing of value, how, or let's just say I treat myself as a thing of value, that I'm concerned about what happens with myself. I want myself to be in a good state. I can't only value myself. I have to have some understanding of what is in my self-interest.
And that means committing to some values that are not about me, that are just sort of generally valuable. Like, say, money and power, even if I just wanted to do that, right? I'm treating money and power as valuable things. So now my set of things in reality which are valuable includes me, but also these other things too. So there's no way for me to actually only value myself. It's always going to have to be cashed out with something else. And once that happens, once it's like, oh, you, well, you can value things that are not you, then their only question is, okay, why not be consistent then and say, when anybody gets this thing, it's a good thing, and then make your decisions based on that. This is a little similar to what Williams is playing about in his response to the amoralist. He's saying, um, this is a quote I wanted to read. To get the amoralist to consider their situation seems rather uh, to consider the situation of others and like be compassionately responsive to them seems rather an extension of their imagination and understanding rather than a discontinuous step onto something quite different the moral plane so what Williams is saying is that there well here's another quote from him there's no bottomless gulf between the amoralist state and the basic dispositions of morality. So William says, even though we've been doing all this careful work to be like, here's a moralist versus a moralist, and there's a meaningful distinction between those two things, which we've been defining, in terms of becoming one versus the other, this will be a slow slide rather than like a sharp move of like, I'm completely reconfiguring my worldview. That's what Williams is saying. You, it, basically, he's appealing to, does the amoralist care about anybody as getting the foot in the door for leveraging moral considerations a little bit more widely? So once the amoralist is sort of self-observant and recognizes, oh, they have preference for, preferences that involve other people, Williams is just saying, well, just think about that more. Think about what you're doing there, and then start drawing like analogies to extending that to like, well, I can care about this person, okay, so I do that. Uh, why not care about all these other people, too? What is so different from that? Here's another opportunity for something to be invested in, to, to have a, a relationship of meaning with. So why not do that? And maybe some ideas of rational consistency start emerging. And, and basically, Williams' whole strategy is to take those sympathies that are present in the amoralist, which can definitely happen there, and then just extend them until at some point it's basically looking like what moral people are doing, what the moralist is doing. Thinking about things of universal value, of like what's permissible and impermissible. Um, Williams does not see a big divide between those two things. Now that's controversial. I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing up this stuff from Williams because it's sort of interesting as, as part of a debate. The, where this is all going is that Williams has a unique understanding of rationality. He, he is an, an internalist about reasoning. Uh, we've talked about internalism and externalism with epistemology, but now we're, we're talking about it with regard to how to understand rationality, of what it means to have a good reason to do something. And Williams's position, which is, like I said, is pretty controversial. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with it. I don't, I don't think I do, actually. But um, he's got a new idea about how to, how to think about um, rationality here. For, here. Here's the theory that Williams offers talks about something called a subjective motivational set. And this is different for everybody. Your subjective motivational set just includes all the things that motivate you, things that you're concerned about, things you care about, that you have preferences for. And if you're asking, do I have a good reason to do this action? William says, in order for you to have a good reason to do something, that depends on what you care about, your subjective motivational set. If you care about that thing directly, well, then you've got a direct reason for doing that action, but you could also have reason to do that action if there's an indirect path. So if I, um, let me try to break this down a little bit. Let's say I have a, uh, a preference for P, something, something I care about, P. Uh, let's say um, I want to eat. Okay, let's do a really basic example. So I value eating, being able to survive through eating food, right? So I guess my real concern is survival, but I want to eat as, in order to survive. And I'm thinking, do I have reason to go to work, to do this behavior? And maybe I don't want to go to work, 
So I don't have a direct motive from my subjective motivational set to do that work. In my case, I, I have a direct reason because I love my job. <laughs> so I like, I like teaching. I like conversing with all of you and getting to know you and working on all these cool ideas to consider. So I've got a direct reason from William's book to, to show up to teach, right? But imagine that you did it. I've had jobs that I didn't give a shit about, but I had good reason to go to work. Why? Not because I have a direct motive to do it, but because I believe if I go to work, I will get money, which will allow me to eat, and I care about eating. So in an indirect way, I have a path toward doing this action. So Williams thinks if you're in a debate with someone and you're trying to give them a reason to do something, like, say, respect principles of morality, you've got to connect it with their subjective motives. You basically have to sell it to them based on what they care about already. Um, that's his approach. So he sees rationality as really just a kind of formal playing with things that are just these sort of uh, feeling stuff about what you're motivated to care about, your subjective motivational set. So um, when it comes to Williams thinking about giving a reason to the amoralist to act morally or to participate in the moral game, he's going to try to look at what are the motivations that the amoralist already has and how to extend them, maybe more indirectly, to now becoming someone different. And he thinks that as you... Um, this is part of Williams' more developed theory, your subjective motivational set is never static. As you sort of engage in other things, you may acquire new um, motives, but kind of based off of the ones that you have already. So you might have noticed this uh, with yourself in life, that you cared about some things, and they caused you to pursue other things initially indirectly, but then you start to value them for their own sake. Um, or you're, now that you're acquainted with them, you're like, oh, I, I kind of actually like this. Like... Um, I don't know, this is conceivable. Yeah, you don't have to tell me if this is true of you, but you might have signed up for this class just looking for what you thought was going to be some easy five credits or something. I mean, that's possible. Students have told me as much in the past. Um, and they're like, yeah, I didn't really have any interest in philosophy or something like that. But after taking the class, now I'm like, oh, I kind of like this, or this is interesting to me, or now I'm, I might take some more philosophy classes. And that's different now. The, the relationship, the your subjective motivational set has been evolving. It's been modifying along with the process. And I think that's what Williams has in mind. If you can just get uh, the existing motives that the Abe moralist has and just get them to extend their scope a little bit, slowly but surely, they will transform into a moralist. So that's Williams' response. He's, he's like, what reason is there to be moral? Well, we can chart a path from even the amoralist's existing preferences and motives to a moral lifestyle. That's his way of approaching the why be moral question. Now, there's some, definitely some potential objections about that. I, I, I might put this little bee in your bonnet, that um, the problem of why be moral could still reemerge even under William's casting of it, because the question could be, why should I extend my sympathies? What reason do I have to pursuing a path of evolving my character to where I become one that does care about that? Kind of, this is kind of the flip side of the scenario that I described earlier about maybe I can imagine someone be choosing a course of action which turns them into the psychopath, right? Into someone who doesn't have any affective or emotional preferences or responsiveness to the well-being of others whatsoever. Like in a, a very... I, I'm not even sure that that's really a good way to define sociopathology or psychopathology. Those terms are actually much much maligned and debated and controversial themselves. But imagining someone who just has no preferences that in, involve other people as the object, that's that's the real core principle thing that's going on here. Um, I think there, that is a, a potential option. And the question is, yeah, what way should we be developing our character? It seems like we want to figure out the why be moral question first, and then that's a derivative of that, rather than the other way around, the way that Williams is doing it. So um, I hope this has been interesting. Um, I want to check in with everybody. That took longer than I was thinking it would. Again, I just always underestimate how much time it is for us to get into this. So I was like, maybe do some Nietzsche. Now it's starting to look like I ran out of time again. Um, but how's this going for everybody? It has been interesting. Cool. May we have some discussion about this? Um, 
what are what are your reactions to all this? What other thoughts have you been having? Um, getting into the debate here with Williams and maybe with me and the contributions I've been making. Um, how, does it kind of make you think about the why be moral question in a different way than you did before? Um, from when we had that discussion earlier this week, uh, I, I'd love to hear from you. What are what are you thinking? And if you have any questions too. Couples of people saying that they they think it's interesting. Those of you on YouTube later who can't see the comments. Definitely, Vernadette says, definitely a different light with the YB moral question. Something I haven't even thought about in that way. Um, what sort of changed for you, uh, Vernadette, if you can put any words to it uh, over the course of this week while we've been talking about it? What, what are the, the things that you've noticed shifting around? <laughs> How do I even put it into words? Yeah, it could be kind of hard. Yeah. This why be moral question is a very abstract one, and it pulls on so much. Um, it's The scope of it is really big and broad. And I think it's also worth acknowledging, I'm just kind of adding it while other people are typing stuff into the chat here, that in my experience, I should do this, it's not like all of us are in the same boat with this question. What it means, what's, what's the significance or the meaning of being invested in morality can look really different for one person's circumstances versus somebody else's circumstances, especially given asymmetry of power and um, privilege in our society, it, it takes on a kind of different significance. Um, I kind of like to hope, kind of like the infinite diversity and infinite combinations uh, and the integration of this stuff, that in considering what um, a relationship to morality looks like under the circumstances of people who are not us, uh, of, that are the circumstances that aren't the ones that we face, has import and changes our understanding of our own position with it too. To have like a more full and complete um, sort of recognition of what does it mean for me to choose this and how meaningful is that. Um, I, I think that's always worth acknowledging that we're not all in the same boat in thinking about, especially when it comes to any kind of concern of choosing self-interest versus participating in moral consideration of others, the consequences of that are different for different people. And what tools they have for participating with that are different as well. Um, Helena says, I'd agree with Vernon Dett. I also liked how you mentioned that it was psychopaths or sociopaths. Either way, it just made me think deeper about people with those minds and why they would think that way. Yeah, the, just as a, a, an academic scholastic sort of thing here, some people want to use, um, and this is true in philosophy, psychology, sociology, these, these kind of humanistic things that um, psychopaths and sociopaths are terms that people want to relate to different things. Some people use those terms interchangeably. Um, when people use them for different, as a contrast between psychopaths and sociopaths, sometimes people carve up that difference in different ways. Uh, so there's not a kind of industry standard thing about this. I think for the purposes of William's conversation, what he's really interested in is someone who just has a subjective motivational set that doesn't include preferences that involve other people as the object whatsoever. Um, they're kind of um, antisocial, but even that term is not uh, very... Um, complete in terms of, of what we're talking about. Um, Faith says, I think the idea of selling morals to an amoralist is interesting because it seems like such a difficult task, but your example of relating it to their subjective internal morals makes sense, especially for debates. Yeah, there's there's a question here, um, uh, Faith, in terms of the idea of selling. Like I said, this is a controversial way of thinking about rationality. There's plenty of people, a lot of so-called moral realists, people who are realists about moral matters that want to say, yeah, even if a person can't be sold on the idea, that doesn't mean it isn't rational. Um, as one uh, contemporary philosopher puts it, 
his name's Russ Schaefer Landau. I teach him in my ethics class. I've actually met him personally. He does a big meta ethics conference in Wisconsin every year. Um, at, uh, but anyway, um, he says instead of thinking that they don't have a reason to say uh, avoid doing incredibly unjust or uh, cruel actions, shouldn't we rather, as he puts it, convict them of a kind of blindness? that the reasons are out there, they just can't see them. And the fact that they're so intransigent, that they're unwilling to change their ways or be responsive to moral demands, uh, doesn't threaten the rationality of those demands. That's how he puts it. So there's a lot of controversy about this. When I've um, taken my stab at framing up this why be moral debate, uh, I've said things like, one of, I, I, one of the concerns I got on my radar about how we give an answer to the why be moral question or to the egoist or something like that um, is I'd be worried if you're, if you're giving people reasons to engage in moral action that really do derive from self-interested reasons, then you're not actually justifying morality. All you're doing is coercing moral-looking behavior. That really the, the main meaning of morality does come from having a sincere and authentic valuing for what happens to others. Not just that I have personal self-interested motives for not harming you, but that I don't harm you because I value you. That's a totally different thing. Just imagine like a, a friendship or um, a partnership or something like that where it's just a pure quid pro quo. And that seems really different than being actually invested in the good of each other. That this is a, just a totally different relationship that has different meaning to it. Um, so we might not be able to sell morality in that kind of way. Um, Bernadette says, the different types of morality um, and how they are similar and how we view them, why do we even have them, is such a great question because we are normally used to that it just is. Yeah, the, the I completely sympathize with you on this. Um, morality is so often taken as a given. And um, I actually, I've actually said this before sometimes with this unit of this class that I, I'm, um, I have paused before about even doing the YB moral question, like when I first taught the class and I was designing it, um, of like, some of my students I think were suspicious that they were like, why are we even asking this question? Oh, am I back? Can you see me? Okay, okay, okay. Looks like we had a little connection hiccup. Um, so it's, it's like, it's kind of dangerous to ask the question, why be moral? Because what if the answer is, there is no answer? Is this class just going to be like, uh, generate moral apathy or cynicism or something? Um, uh, so, I, you know, it, it is kind of dangerous to ask that question. So there have been some topics in ethics, kind of like uh, the torture debate comes to mind where there's some philosophers who are like, we shouldn't be debating this, because by debating it, that encourages in some other people the thought that maybe this could be permissible when it isn't permissible ever. It's like categorically wrong, so we shouldn't even be discussing it. We shouldn't even be asking the question, should I be moral, because that might give people the impression that maybe it's rational to not be moral, and that's not the case, or we need to protect against that. Or This is kind of like the logic of censorship. For my part, for my two cents on this, I'm like, yeah, let's have this discussion. Because I actually think what's more dangerous is if we just take morality for granted and we don't have an understanding of why we're doing it. If we have a justification for it, then when the shit hits the fan, when it's no longer convenient to act morally, if you know why it's really justified, then your commitment to it will be that much stronger. Um, that you, you're you not going to be tempted into uh, doing what's comfortable or what's easier for you. Uh, like Like a lot of moral matters are deeply uncomfortable. I mean, having to confront your own culpability uh, for participating in injustice or something like that, that, people don't like that. People don't like having the spotlight of critical evaluation on them. There's so much guilt and shame noise that goes on in our relationships with morality, and I don't think it, it has to be that way, but it often is that way, and it makes it tempting for us to avoid opportunities for sort of being critically evaluated that way, or that we, we'd we rather just go along under the assumption that it doesn't get reflected about, oh yeah, I'm a moral person. I, I, can, I can sleep good at night, and if I never really look at myself, 
to see if that is actually the case um, or that I have a genuine investment in pursuing those values and making sure my life is as much as possible engaged with them. I really like this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, um, no one knows how bad they are until they try really hard to be good. And I think in the absence of really sincerely doing that, it's a lot easier to tell some story about ourselves like we're, we are ethical people and not taking into account all those possibilities. Oh, I haven't given a code word out yet. Um, uh, let's do um, Clive Owen. Clive Owen is our code word for today. <laughs> um, Helena asks, quick question to clarify. Would you say that an immoralist still has moral views, just has a different set of morals? Yes, that is, that's what we are defining with the, the immoralist is still under the category of being a moralist in that they are playing the moral game in how they make decisions. They, they are thinking about or sensitive to um, judgments of what is right and wrong as a way of deciding how they're going to act. They just maybe have the wrong standards of what is right and wrong that is informing their action. And that's, that's, if they were in that case, that would be what makes them the immoralist. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Faith has got the right spelling on that. If, if you're close, I'll, I'll know. <laughs> I'm not going to be picky about it. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're out of time for today. We didn't get into Nietzsche a whole lot, but we actually kind of seeded the ground for themes that are relevant to Nietzsche. Um, as I've been sort of indicating, um, I'm going to turn my hat back here. Uh, we're just going to be able to scratch the surface with Nietzsche. So there's so much cool stuff going on that I will be looking to have you I'll direct our attention a little bit more when we get together next Monday for just like what it is about the Nietzsche reading that you find interesting or compelling or confusing and we can kind of just follow your leads and, and unpack whatever you want. Nietzsche kind of writes in a, he writes in the same aphoristic style that Wittgenstein does so it's kind of all over the place, right? He's got all these different ideas and um, so I'll want to follow your lead on Monday. So please come to class if you can and be prepared to participate in that way. Um, no journal. Yep, you're working on the papers for me. Um, if anyone wants to stick around for a few more minutes, though, and, and talk more about this stuff about why be moral and amoralism, I'd be happy to do that. We are not going to be in class in person next week for, for this or for the bonus finals uh, session. Yeah. You're welcome, everyone. Anyone else want to get, get something in here? Um, uh, have a little little bit more discussion if you can stick around. You're very welcome. See you next week. That's okay. Yeah, if anyone wants to talk more too, you can always call me up. I mean, I, I love talking with all of you, so um, always welcome. Just a quick question. Do you still want us to turn in the Nietzsche reading comments? Yeah, but if, if these things are late, uh, it'll be understandable. I mean, I, I'm, I, even when I have a deadline on there, on the schedule, if we don't actually get to it, then I feel like it's only fair to let you turn it in late. That's okay. That's all right. Yeah, and I, I just, things are weird this quarter, so I'm just going to be understanding about it. You're welcome. I know it's the end of the quarter and things are busy too. So if you take the time at all <clears throat> to invest in doing this reading and doing the reading comments, then I, I am happy to reward you for that. I know you've got a lot of balancing act stuff going on. All right, looks like it's just you, Aaron. Did you want to talk about anything? Oh, you're gone too. Okay, all right. See you on YouTube, people. Bye. Hope you have a good weekend.